So we're live with Kevin Green and, you know, there's been a lot going, a lot of developments in the market. And I think the coolest one that we could talk about to just start, you know, we've been talking about and, and something Kevin and I first talked about when we first met was the fact that the data is going to start to show up hot if we continue to have the underlying inflationary assets like in the energy sector turning up over and over again. We continue to see that. Um, that's just kind of been the trend. And now we're kind of looking at all these prints kind of coming out. What did you see in the CPI report uh, and the PPIs this week, Kevin? Yeah, so for, for CPI, I would say, obviously, one of the biggest things is the energy push. And we saw that with gasoline. But, you know, uh, one thing I did notice, and it happened in the last print as well, the retail price changes are not fully being reflected in the CPI. So I always kind of had that question, is there still more left to go when it comes to gasoline? And so that's a, a one key area that I focused on. And then the shelter component continues to be fairly sticky and we're not seeing any type of budging there at all. There's always this conversation of how it's calculated and, and I get that, uh, but at the end of the day, you gotta play the game how the game is played, right? And at the end of the day, it's just not budging right now. And uh, you know that, that survey data that's out there is really not budging. The consumer mindset when it comes around shelter is not really budging. Um, the the tailwind i would say well, the one win that i would say is it would be food from home i mean i think we saw an increase of about 0.1 percent on a month over month basis but we've seen a lot of the soft products cocoa um, coffee oj um, and even some of the livestock products like like pork uh, which continues to see spot cut prices still going higher on a day-by-day -day basis and i believe if i'm not mistaken we hit close to an all-time high on pork prices a couple of days ago, midday spot prices, USDA prices, butcher prices is what we're talking about, not the, the futures contracts. Um, don't quote me on that, but we're, we're close to all-time highs there. So we continue to see a lot of demand, um, supply concerns when you're talking about the pork side. Cattle's a little bit different, um, but once again, the trend is hot. And we had, that, we had a conversation on Monday, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And or Tuesday, it was Tuesday because they had the eclipse. Yeah. And Tuesday I came out and said, you know, I wrote in my weekly prep, hey, like this is going to be a hot print. I, and a lot of analysts had very low expectations for it. And I just I didn't see why. And just like you with your models, I do modeling on my own as well. Uh, and and I just didn't see where that connection was. And, and it seems like we kind of, you know, I feel vindicated for a little bit. Right. Which is great. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's still a problem. And now this is the third print that we see uh, where month over month uh, continues to be coming in fairly hot. And then also year over year prints are showing reflation. And now we're seeing the pushback of, uh, of Fed cut expectations now back to September. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll kick it to you here in a second. I just want to highlight something mm -hmm. because everybody believes and <laughs> they don't probably now. Hold on, Kevin. You froze for a second. Let's uh, see if we can get Kevin back here. One sec. We got Kevin's on. Uh, he's frozen. Let me send him a message, see if we can get him back here. All right, he's going to come in and out. But, you know, it's at the same time what Kevin's talking about is the same thing we're kind of seeing across the board. Um, you know, the underlying inflation is always going to show up first, right? So if we're looking at the market and we're going, okay, well, gasoline's had a great run. If I look at it, you know, year to date, if I'm looking at oil, oil's up 20% year to date. If I'm looking at gasoline up 17% year to date, Silver's up 15% year to date. Cocoa, obviously, everybody knows how crazy that one is. Um, and that's not heavy in um, any of these reports like CPI and so on. So, you know, Cocoa is not going to really run what the Fed's doing. So that's not something that we really need to pay much attention to in that sense. But once again, it's also the problem with the underlying commodities market that we're seeing. Um, there's 
becoming a lot of demand, underlying demand as we're kind of looking across the board at all these different things. If you saw my uh, recent report that I put out yesterday, I talk about coffee a lot in that. I put a little post on Twitter about it. You can find the link on Twitter as well. So as you're looking at all those things, you can kind of figure out where the market's heading. Um, and so then we can look at where the CPI is heading. So we have all this underlying data kind of coming in over and over again. So Kevin says internet dropped. He's going to come back in one second. But, you know, as we're looking at all these things though, right now, I just kind of wanted to get on here today to kind of go through what's been going on in the commodities market and where we're going to end up. Um, and also let's talk about, as Kevin talked about the reflationary environment, if we're looking at the reflation trade, and this is something that we should always be paying attention to what the sectors are doing, where the rotations are happening. Um, can we run into, you know, a, an environment where energy leads for a long time? We absolutely can. So I think that we're going to see energy kind of leading the way for a little bit longer. Uh, Kevin's back. We're going to let him finish his thought. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Right. First of all, I have a bone to pick with Comcast, but I can't <laughs> go into that too much. You still have me? Yeah, your your okay. volume's a little bit low. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like booting back up here. So, okay, you're um, good. All right, cool. Now I got you. All right. Yeah, I got a bone to pick with Comcast, man. Oh, no worries, man. It happens. Okay, so um, what I was saying is um, we are seeing that reflation, uh, reflation narrative taking place. And, oh, I was talking about Fed fund futures, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, back in the day, believe it or not, Fed fund futures were a really great indicator. Mm -hmm. They no longer are a great indicator. And when people look at that market, you have to understand – institutions trade that market, not speculators. Speculators aren't going out and saying, hey, I'm buying Fed fund futures at 99 and a half and I'm going all in. They don't trade like that. Um, it's a lot of uh, financial institutions that are utilizing it in order to be able to hedge portfolios. And so when we see these adjustments of we move it from July to September, that could be 11,000 contracts, 15,000 contracts just rolling, right? Like it, there's a lot of different things that actually can take place. So don't take the Fed fund futures as gospel. Um, look at them as a reference point, but also look at what the, the two year is doing. Because the two year is a little bit more stronger uh, when it comes to that particular print. You got me? Yep, you're still there. You're okay, good. yeah, I'm Yeah, I'm just glitching, just glitching <laughs> today. So you know, it's not bad. It's not bad on my end, at least. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I would just say that that's like my main takeaway there. Like we're gonna figure out we're gonna figure out the situation. The Fed's gonna be in a little bit of a rock and a hard place. But here's the thing that you're also gonna have as a tailwind is going to be in August and September. Okay, so we have the September cut being priced in, and also in September we had the highest comps for energy. I believe in September that's right around where we hit what ninety two bucks in crude oil. Um, that's where we peaked out for gasoline. So the base effects for a September cut does look favorable, but things can change in an instant. And the PPI numbers were actually very encouraging because diesel prices actually did not increase that much last, last month. Gasoline prices did, but diesel prices did not. And diesel prices are really what drives PPI and, 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 and industrial production, um, especially when you're talking about transporting goods. So I think that's gonna also be a tailwind, but we're, we're right now in a rock and hard place. So what do we do from an equity standpoint? What are we looking at? Well, we've seen a lot of places catch a little bit of a bid. NVIDIA is starting to catch a bid. Now, that did have a technical correction over 10%. Uh, We're seeing bidders coming back in to that space. You're seeing Apple today up 1.2% in the market. You're seeing Amazon up about maybe 1%, getting close there. So you, if you do have this fear in the market about reflation, people just tend to go back to the things that they know. And the things that worked for them in the past were mega cap tech that have cash on their balance sheets that are able to weather the storm regardless. The ones that don't work are small cap companies, um, regional banks. We kind of talked about the risk that's there and you kind of saw that rotation. So I think earnings season is going to be a definite driver, but from the CPI standpoint, there were some really hot spots that I don't think the market expected. PPI I think gives the market a little, a little bit, a little bit of breathing room, but not much uh, because we once again, continue to see elevated prices on the commodity front. What do you think? 
No, and I completely agree. And, I, I, you know, I, I really think it's important right now to, you know, people always say things like it's a stock picker's market. Um, and I guess as a macro guy, I never have understood that because I always think it's a sector picking environment. You know, like it's when we're in a sector picking environment, what that means is you're going to see certain sectors start to be the outperformers. And like we're talking about across the board, you know, we have energy, uh, you know, if we look at a one month time frame, what's what's leading the way. Let me sort that real fast. So energy leading the way on a one month time frame up uh, almost 10 percent right now. Communications right behind that. Well, way far behind that. Sorry, it's it's up only uh, it's almost four percent right now. Um, if we look at, you know, what's go when the in the U.S. industries and subsectors, gold miners, gold miners is leading the way up 12 percent um, oil and gas, which is XOP. Uh, we are along that as well in the in our newsletter. So if you guys see that, you guys can check that out. That's up 10% right now. Oil services up 8%. Um, you know, metals and mining up 7%. And then everything is way behind, behind that. So what does this environment tell me when I'm seeing things like gold miners, uh, oil and gas, oil services, metals and mining? These are all leading the way. That's kind of a reflationary environment. You know, we have to really think about that because that's that's what we're seeing. So once again, once you see that, then you can kind of dig in and figure out where you want to be positioned. Do I want to be positioned in gold miners? OK, then if you're a stock picker on top of it, then you can dig into it. Um, I think that's the easiest way to really kind of find value and outperformance, because if you're not figuring out the things that are outperforming the S&P 500, you're going to have very similar returns to the S&P 500 which means you should just basically chill, put your money in the S&P 500 and be a passive investor. Um, that's None of us here are like that. So what do we do? So we find these sectors, we find stocks inside of these sectors or by the sectors themselves and just camp out in those areas. I think it's going to be very important to, on top of those, you know, let's look at the, my screen's over here. So I'm, I'm not uh, avoiding you guys. I'm just looking at I, my screens. <laughs> But uh, but so looking at these other sectors, you know, year to date, I mean, it's just or sorry, the commodities and the futures performance year to date, you know, crude is is way up there, you know, 20 percent um, gasoline looking good. Lean hogs continues to just show uh, perseverance in the face of everything. Uh, co coffee. Coffee has been another one. You know, we just talked about that yesterday. Uh, there's so many areas in the commodities market that look great and i think the thing when people see cocoa they're like oh my god this is insane and it's like runs like i mean not to this extent this quickly i don't see usually i don't see 200 percent moves in in a in, you know four month time frame that's really impossible I, I i don't know if i've ever seen that before however moves of 30 40 50 100 moves in the commodity market that's very common so looking at something like coffee, which has a very, very similar setup to the same setup that Coco had, not to the same extremes. I'm not saying like I'm looking for 180 percent or 200 percent move in coffee this month. I'm just saying like coffee is, has a great setup. It's set up well. But we see those types of setups all the time in the commodity space. So really right here is, is a good time to kind of get used to trading some futures, understanding these different sectors. And then you can kind of get away from, you know, everybody we talk to, Kevin, they're kind of in the same boat of like, I'm a growth investor. I invest in tech. And it's like, yeah, that's that's awesome. And as a long term investor, you can absolutely just buy some tech stocks and sit on your hands for the next 20 years and maybe you'll be OK. I'm not that way. I don't believe that. But some people do that and they do well, not not hating on it at all. I'm just saying as a short term trader, if you're not even short term as in day trading, short term as in swing trading to position trading, meaning, you know, months to a year. If you're in those types of time frames, you have to be willing to move out of those things like technology when you're starting to see outperformance in other areas. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And actually, energy is leading the way from all sectors year to date now. Um, so it's definitely performing well. You know, I would be very cautious with the, the energy move, too, especially when you're looking at the energy stocks. They are definitely uh, they have been able to catch up. They have been that catch up trade compared to the commodities themselves. Right. Compared to crude or compared to gasoline. So 
Um, and actually natural gas players have been getting a bid too. I think that's just overall passive flows getting into those names too, but be very careful with them. Um, you know, tight stops, make sure that you got your risk parameters that are out there. Um, because once again, it's the reflation trade that has been working. Um, we need to see if the Fed's going to also continue to allow that that reflation trade to work as well, because that's that's basically what has happened. Is the Fed has um, fumbled the ball a little bit, and and we have a scenario where demand continues to be fairly high. Uh, we did see a little bit of a slide in crude oil, and actually we saw this yesterday uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, crude was trading on around eighty four and some change, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, then we had the geopolitical news that came out, right? The, the warning about Iran and all the stuff. And, and so then we saw another dollar pop to the upside with crude oil. So it's trading right now at it around $85 and 50 cents. Uh, it seems like there's some supply hitting the market, um, but the supply just cannot offset the geopolitical risk. So that's another one where I'm just kind of highlighting, like just be a little bit cautious right now when it comes to that crude oil trade, because there could be an upside pump if we do see an escalation, the hardest thing about trading around geopolitical news is that you don't know when it's going to happen and you don't know if it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, that can also lead credence to downside pressures as well as the anticipation starts to fade off or that IV starts to, 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 uh, you know, to move down. Um, but once again, I just kind of, you know, keep going with 80 to $85. The crude has not violated its upper channel range yet. It tried to, and it has not been able to do so. Consolidation and another push to the upside, I think, would be a little bit of a benefit. So that's what I'm seeing there. Um, also, when you're looking at gasoline, I think that's going to be another one uh, just to kind of be mindful of. Correlations are starting to break, to fracture. Mm -hmm. Let's say fracture, not break yet. But we're starting to see some fracturing when it comes to correlations between heating oil, gasoline, and crude. They're all kind of doing their own thing. That's what happens when you have speculators starting to flood that space. So a lot of choppy action there. Uh, and then I, I think natural gas, I'm not making a play on this um, by any stretch of the imagination. It's down, what, 5%, 6% today. Mm -hmm. But also going back to the geopolitical stuff, Russia is just knocking out utility uh, uh, you know, power stations and things of that nature in the Ukraine. Um, they're also targeting underground natural gas uh, storage facilities as well. And there is a major pipeline that goes through the Ukraine that Russia and Gazprom actually provide the EU with natural gas, and they're still providing them natural gas. Um, it seems like Russia is escalating. If it, you know, if that pipeline were to be a target for whatever reason, if they wanted to sacrifice <laughs> their their profitability on natural gas lines in order to try to you know provoke a response. Uh, that would be an area where natural gas could catch a little bit of a bend. There is a floor, or there is some downward pressure on natural gas because of the seasonality effect. We're going into injection season, and then also yes. Freeport LNG is is also having some issues trying to get back online. And so that LNG flows has also been backed up a little bit, which is pushing pressures down. But Freeport sounds like they're going to try to get back online here in the next couple of weeks. They got two of their terminals up. They're working on getting another one up. They just got an approval for it a couple of days ago, I believe two, two or three days ago. So that should be coming back online. And then once we start seeing those flows, maybe that puts a floor in on the natural gas trade in the, in the near term. So that would be a near term item that I'm keeping my eye on. What about you, though, Jason? Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at natural gas, I think it's kind of, you know, if, I, if I'm putting my uh, my technical hat on and just my price action signals, you know, we're just kind of waiting for it to really clear $2. Like, really, like, that's kind of the simplest way to look at it. We have a small position where I got a great fake out right at that point, <laughs> which is very normal for breakout trading. You get this these breakouts, it comes back. Our stop is right around those lows still. At about 1.6, 1.5, I think it's exactly 1.57. So, you know, if we're looking at that, we can kind of go, okay, well, just chopping around. But the safe trade, so that's a half position for us. The way our systems work, we have one signal that's a little bit more short term, and then another signal would be a little bit longer term. So we need to get up and over that $2 level. Does it have the ingredients of a good trade? Yes, absolutely. Uh, however, it's natural gas. It's very tough, very hard to predict. I love, um, you know, using it price action based. You know, that's kind of how my all my systems work, but especially for natural gas, like natural gas is not something that I feel like I have a predictive ability on. 
But I do think that it could absolutely move higher here. Like it, it does have the ingredients. It does look like it's trying to bottom. Um, there was another one too. We were talking about crude and talking about crude. Uh, another thing, if we also put on our technical hat again, um, the highest volume level is that level that you're talking about, $85. So if we're looking at 85, we're going, okay. I think the one thing that I've seen a year time after time, and the one very predictive thing that you can back test that works well is when resistance becomes support and then something hangs out above that zone. And so right now, as we're looking at crude, it is kind of hanging out above that zone. It is chopping sideways. Once again, we're already long crude, but if you were to take a trade in it, I would really wait for it to clear that, that level of 8750 uh, get a close up there and it could trend up and make another move higher to maybe that 95 level. But for now, I would really kind of, if, if I didn't have a position, I would go, okay, well, I'm not going to buy unless it clears that 8750 level. And I'm planning on possibly selling, if you do sh go long and short, um, that 85 level for short term traders. For me, as a longer term trader, the trend is starting to move up. I'm going to stay on the long side until I get a sell signal. Um, and like you said about all these things kind of, you know, drifting apart a little bit. And we'll see that. And it's kind of like the crazy thing. When you talk to like somebody who really trades a systematic futures model, you'll hear a lot of the times that we're long things like heating, heating oil, gasoline, and oil all at the same time, even the energy sector. So we're long all those at the at the same time. However, one, you have to really, you have to have the size of your account to do that. You can't do that with a small account. So you have to be careful to do that until you get to the point where you're like, okay, I can trade that type of size. So I, I suggest, you know, if you do, don't have that size yet, doing something like, hey, I'm just trading oil. Um, hey, I'm just trading gasoline. Or just finding out, hey, I'm only taking the trade in the one that's showing the most relative strength. Mm -hmm. But if we're looking at all three of these, and the, oh, and the other point I have is, the reason why we do that is because sometimes these things completely move away from each other. You know, gasoline will be this crazy outperformer. I remember one time heating oil had a crazy move and oil didn't go anywhere. Um, so, so this is the reason why we trade all these things kind of across the board. But also then we'll take down our position sizing. So, if you know, if, if I'm risking 1% per trade of my whole portfolio on oil, let's say, and then I have three things that are highly correlated, I might go to 50 basis points or even less to try to make sure all three of these things aren't, you know, taking control of my entire portfolio, moving to the upside or the downside. Um, but yeah, I think the energy sector is incredibly interesting. I think we could talk about it all day, but I also think the other thing that's interesting is that so many people think that it's over. They're like, oh, you missed the move, you know? And it's like, I'm not saying, you know, hey, it's this is the perfect buying opportunity, but I am saying, hey, it's bre breaking, breaking out to another 52 week high. Um, you know, we are seeing all everything saying we're in the right environment for that trading vehicle, as in XLE, XOP, and so on. So if you're able to get a good entry or a good entry for you, it's gonna be different for everybody. It's like, but I think that's something that's important is some people buy all-time highs. I mean, I met so many people over the years, the other trading strategy was buying 52 week highs and that's it. And they made a lot of money. You know, they made a ton of money doing this. Um, so, I mean, you can buy highs. I think where people get into trouble is when they do the opposite, when they're like trying to buy lows all the time. I think more people would make money in the markets if they did the thing that was less intuitive, which is just buying new highs all the time instead of always trying to buy lows. Um, so I think that's incredibly important. Also, go, getting back to that, like that's that's not fighting the tape. That's the goal of not fighting the tape. Not saying, hey, this is the perfect strategy. Just do it this way and you'll make all the money in the world. I'm saying change your mindset a little bit from trying to always catch bottoms to, hey, this has momentum behind it. I'd rather be on the long side of, of momentum and I'd rather be on the short side when it's falling the other direction. Um, but yeah, so I really like the look of this market. I just continue to kind of see this inflationary environment something i want to talk to you about because we were on a uh, on a call the other day and somebody brought this up too it was kind of funny they were talking about small caps and the fact that small caps um don't like this type of environment and i was like you know that's kind of 
somebody whoever said that doesn't understand what's inside of the small caps index. Uh, they were talking about financials and stuff, and like not under, saying that hey, interest rates being up here means you know finance uh, financials um, hate interest rates high. And he was having this whole conversation. I thought it was kind of interesting because it was like as a macro guy, I know for a fact that like the inflationary environment is usually uh do, does well when rates are just starting to hike or rates are high um and then not to mention the yield curve is moving the other direction uh which we have all that right now so once again it's coming out of inversion a little bit what that means is that the banks are able banks usually um most make their money on the long side so when they give you people loans and and so on you know there's a on the 30-year yield and then on the short side is the other side of it, which is what the Fed fa Fed rate is. So the Fed rate being, you know, five percent. Let's say the thirty year. It's the let's say it's inverted, like it was at, at one point this uh, the, in the last couple of years. You know, the the Fed rate's five percent, and then the thirty year yield is like four percent. This means the banks are losing money. So if we flip it the other direction. And then, you know, let's say in the in the very special, <laughs> amazing times that we'll probably won't see again, Fed rates are zero. And then we flip it the other way and go the 30 year mortgage is at 4%. Like this way, the banks are making money. So we're kind of seeing us come out of inversion. The banks should be doing better in that type of environment. Markets are very complex and you can't just say, hey, rate cuts equals good for stocks rate hikes equal bad for stocks. Like it's a lot more than that. So, you know, I kick that back to you, but I know we, uh, you, you and I talked about this a bunch of times. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so it depends on how the bank is structured, right? So you're right. When you have an inverted market, it makes it difficult for them to turn a profit. Um, but we are seeing a situation where banks are lend are, are basically lending out around 250 basis points, if I want to sound cool, but mm -hmm. two, two and a half percent higher than what, let's say the 10 year is. And it depends on what financial institution. So a lot of financial institutions actually lend between seven and 10. That's their lending arm, if you will. And then they're still borrowing on the short. So let's say that they are, um, you know, their, their 10 year rate or give or take, right? Uh, is Right now they're sitting at four and a half percent. They're probably lending at mortgages at around seven percent. I think that was actually the NBA average last week. And the NBA average, just also keep in mind, that's somebody that has a really good credit score. So anything that's above that is obviously going to also have a premium put on top of that for their yield. Or if it's FHA, there might be other uh, you know uh, points that are added on and things of that nature, right? But and you're right, they lend on the or they borrow on the short. So. When you see the normalization of the curve, that's actually the prime time for banks. Mm -hmm. I think there is a there's something to be a little bit cautious though. If you have this reflationary environment, and we are seeing that in the CPI, and you have wages going down, and we already know that the purchasing power for a lot of consumers are very low, and the demand for loan origination also decreases at a fairly rapid clip. That's kind of where these banks would then get into trouble because maybe the risk is too much out there to lend uh, to a consumer because their credit quality has gone down. Uh, maybe they, instead of doing 7%, they need to do 7.5% to cover their, their risk. And so we could have a synthetic slowdown when it comes to lending operations in general. Um, and then that's kind of the bread and butter for a lot of these regional banks. A lot of the regional banks, that's what they do. They don't, they're not in there um, uh, helping companies uh, com become, you know, IPO and things of that nature. Yeah. A lot of regionals don't do that. They, they're trying to originate mortgages. They're trying to bring in asset dollars. And then they may have an auto lending arm and maybe a small fraction of a credit card arm that they're partnering with others to be able to offset risk. Uh, and, and they have a portfolio within their book that obviously they, they have on their books and they want to have that portfolio grow or mitigate risk. And some of these, a small sliver of these regional banks have risk when it comes to the CRE portfolio, right? So we saw the sell-off yesterday when it came to the CPI report, especially in the regionals. I mean, at one point they were down like 5% and rightfully so, because if the Fed doesn't cut rates, the Fed cuts rates and that immediately impacts short duration rates, not long duration. So 
If the Fed cuts 75 basis points, it doesn't mean the whole curve jumps down by 75 basis points, right? Like that's not how that happens. The lower end, the, the shorter end, where it's going to have that lever. The higher end is it's going to move, but it's not going to move as much. That cut spread is really where the meat and potatoes is going to be for profitability for banks until you see a normalization on that long end of that curve, right? And that could be a six month window, that could be a year window. Who knows? I think the biggest risk right now is the slowing of lending, which we are already seeing on the housing market, but the slowing of lending. And, you know, I, I think that's that's the risk. But, you know, Jason, like if I'm an investor in, in a financial institution, a traditional one like that, do I want my do I want my investment to like get really like aggressive with lending right now? No, I want them to have risk management. Yep. So you don't really need to. And I think that's going to be the interesting take. You don't really need to have top line growth if you're a financial institution on not the bigger ones, right? The small ones. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to have like show this outsized revenue growth year over year. I think you just need to show that you can be profitable. And I think you just need to show that you have risk parameters that are in place in order to protect yourself against any type of, not any type, but for the majority of black swan events. And I think a lot of these regional banks have done that um, in the background. They've restructured debt, they've uploaded debt, they've gotten insurance products um, to hedge against them, their, their debt. And they did that at a time where everybody hated the regionals anyway. So they were like, you know what? I got to pay a premium in order to protect my book or 80% of my book, 90% of my book, but I can protect it out in the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Some insurance company is going to take that risk off. Guess what? We're already taking hits. So let's just take another hit right now. And a lot of those regionals did that. I think you're going to see the, the fruits of that labor happening here um, in this quarter. So tough environment, man. I mean, uh would you want to be in banks right now maybe not maybe if you're a bottom feeder maybe you find some good ones but it's a tough environment if the fed's not going to hit their mark i don't know how uh the vol just seems too high right now that risk reward ratio is, is a little bit too high but there are, are some banks that are trading fairly cheap so you have like Citibank, and that's a major bank, right? Mm -hmm. Citibank trades at around 80 cents per tangible book value, where JP Morgan trades at literally $2 per tangible book value. You're paying a 200% premium for JP Morgan in just the assets that they have on their book. Citi is trading at 80 cents. Uh, 80 percent uh you know trading at 80 cents on, on book value and actually regional uh, financials in general don't really trade at premiums they usually trade maybe 10 cents or 15 cents uh tangible to book mm -hmm. that you don't usually see a two uh two times tangible to book value for a bank uh, yeah right that's like tech that's like tech company worthy there so mm -hmm. that's that's once again that balance is kind of off right now it's very tough because it's one of those things that I, I don't as a as a trader, financials look great. As in long term investors, I wouldn't, you know, I don't have any in my very long term portfolio, I don't have any banks in there. I don't think I ever uh have, honestly. Uh, but as a trading vehicle, I think it's it's great. It's possibly a good time. It keeps fluctuating in and out of leadership lately. And so I wanna really see that step up to get a little bit more bullish on banks. As a, at the moment, you know, my my relative strength model uses a six month time frame. So that's a half of a year. Um, so as that half year time frame, financials are up 20 percent still. You know, I think it's it's going to be very interesting because the inflation trade usually has that aspect of it where financials are a good buy here. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, it's a tough environment. Rates being the short end being so high is something that I haven't seen banks really shrug off easily. So once again, probably when rates start to fall, it's going to be the place that really is the outperformer. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it still looks good. But once again, it's it's more of the construction of what small caps are, which I wanted to get into, too, uh, which is if we're looking at industrials, we're looking at um, healthcare. So industrials are 17 percent of the IWM, uh, meaning this the Russell uh, 2000. Healthcare is 15%, financial is 14%, um, and technology is behind that. So I think it's kind of interesting to kind of just look at the makeup of that sector as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. And so looking at that sector as a whole and going, okay, well, 
in this and pe people said, you know, this environment, small caps, you know, small caps will only go up if rates are getting cut. And that was a thing, the question that came up in our uh, space the other day. And really, it's like, no, small, small caps can go up. And they usually like an environment where the same environment that banks like, because it's a lot of reflationary sectors are in those where you have the industrials, you have um, the financials, you have a lot of energy even in there. Um, mm -hmm. It's not as much just a small cap tech or, or speculative tech, basically. You have a lot of companies in there that really kind of benefit from that environment. So I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, where small caps end up, because this seems like a good environment for small caps. But once again, like like you mentioned, it's a tough environment for any business right now in general. Yeah, I would say for, for small caps, one thing... I yeah, so they're a little bit more rate sensitive when it comes to capital that they need to fund their operations. And so you have to look at small cap companies or slivers in their business, you know, sectors within small caps that don't really require a lot of capital right now. Right. Um, industrials, that could be the case, right? There's some fair demand there um, that might be um, showing some green shoots. Energy companies right now, the spreads looking pretty decent. They might not need capital, but then you have like high beta tech names where they're going to still need capital. So it does get a little bit more expensive. Um, I would also say that I don't think you can have a sustainable run without regionals though, because regionals mm -hmm. comprise of a significant amount of the earnings power. Mm -hmm. And so if we had this huge run up in the IWM in this environment of high rates and regionals are not participating, then that multiple stretch is just going to be I feel like it's a very hard multiple to justify over the long term, right? Now you would have a short term trend because of bullish flows and people mm -hmm. are you know caught short, but I think that's it, it's a man. I, like I don't know, small caps for me, it's it's very hard. It's very hard to trade that right now, right? Like to go all in. Yeah, you know, you could have a small all sliver in, yeah. of your per portfolio, five percent exposure to it. I could understand that. Um, but to, to say, and I, yeah, we got guys on the yeah, got guys got that are got <laughs> going hard in the paint. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I just feel like that's something that if it pays off, it pays off, but that could be a disaster in the waiting, especially, especially when you're using these three leverage, triple leverage ETFs and, and ETNs. I think that's very dangerous. If you're, you're leveraging up on those, like yesterday, small caps went down to a 3%, that TNA product was down like 10%, you know, three, you know, 9%, 9.5%. That's very dangerous when you're putting, you know, 15, 20%, 30% of your portfolio in that trade trying to YOLO. Like that's, yeah. that's not really good risk management in my opinion. No, I think it's, it's in general, I think the large cap space is where you want to be. You want to be in the large cap space. That's incredibly important. I think people get too stuck in the, hey, I want this major growth, so I have to be in small caps. It's like, well, sometimes it's just not a great time, um, yeah. and, it's, and it's going to be tough right now. You know, for now, you know, we do have a long signal in small caps, but I'm not seeing the momentum or the follow through that I would expect to see. Um, so I, I doubt that it continues to do well in this environment or can even do well. So, all right, mm -hmm. Kevin, I know you got to get going. Thanks Maybe for we'll do it again. Yep. We'll do it again. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to you. I'm gonna tell everybody right now before we we sign off. I think Monday we might have like a little bit of a surprise. I want to reach out to you about it. I got, oh, nice. I got a pretty decent idea that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Um, and I know that you you got a lot of knowledge within the space as well. So um, let's say we'll we'll look forward to that. Uh, All right, on, man. Monday. All right. All right. I'll see you then. See you later, man. Later, Kevin.